I negotiated myself down the stairs without falling, that's good. That's quite a difficult act to follow. Um, if you listen to me, you probably won't have to go to jail, but I'll try and convince you that sleep is something you may be wanting to prioritise. I'm not talking about everybody sleeping for 12 hours a day. I'm talking about everyone maybe getting the extra half hour, the extra hour a day that you know when you wake up in the morning you would have benefited from. Generally in society, we're concentrating less on sleep. There's more to do in the night time. The waking hours are really invading the darkness, which is where we used to have very little else to do other than sleep. Obviously, people used to have 10 or 12 children, so there was obviously something to do during the nighttime hours. But now we've got the iPads, we've got the phones, we've got the computers. We've got artificial light that basically spreads the day as long as you want it to do. And I want to try and convince you that that's maybe not the best way of seeing it, that there is a, a, a way in which you could try and prioritise sleep and get something better out of it. To start off, what are we actually talking about when we mean sleep? Normally, it's a period where you look at someone, if you're just behaviourally observing them, there's nothing happening. And to some extent, that might be one of the reasons why we think of sleep as something that's not important. It's a sign of laziness. It's a sign that really there's nothing exciting happening because everything happens that's exciting in this red period, in this wakefulness. This is what we really want to be doing. The trouble is that as soon as you start observing sleep, as soon as you start observing particularly brain activity during sleep, and people started doing this soon after they started recording brain activity at all in the 30s, you start to identify two different types of sleep, rapid eye movement sleep and non-rapid eye movement sleep, so REM and non-REM, and they're completely different states of consciousness. They're states of consciousness in the sense in which you interact with the world, in the sense in which you perceive yourself and your place within the world. But the more you look at it, and the more you examine particularly what the brain is doing, you split them down even further, and you start to find that that non-REM part has completely different types of activity depending when it happens. So there's non-REM stages one to three, and the brain does very different things during those different stages. They're defined essentially based on brain activity, and the brain is just throwing out completely different types of activity than it would be during wakefulness or during the other stages. What that activity is actually there for is not altogether clear. There's things called vertex shark waves that occur in stage one. They look spiky if you stick electrodes on the scalp, which is the easiest way of doing this. They look like nothing you would see during wakefulness. And there's other kinds of activity that are clearly there, clearly differentiate these different states but we have no real idea what they're actually there for. If you go even further, and essentially the more you look, the more you distinguish different types of activity, different things going on that wouldn't be happening, you can split it down further. And what you'd really want, if you wanted to understand what sleep was doing and the purpose of sleep and, and how sleep fits within the general structure of life, you'd want to know what each of those different types of activity was there for and what it was related to, what its purpose was. Unfortunately, we're not really at that stage. So when we want to understand what sleep is there for and what we can actually get out of it, we almost have to take a stage back. We, we need to go back away from these sleep stages because they're not particularly well understood and go back to just talking about sleep itself. But one day, hopefully, we'll be able to really link these different stages with some of the issues that I'm about to talk about. We've got sleep there. What has it been linked with? And if any of you nod off in about the next five minutes, it's essentially been linked with everything about your brain and your body. So if, if you really don't want to concentrate anymore, then come back in a few minutes, and we'll have a big picture of a brain. Everyone will be happy. The first thing is that... Cognitive functions generally, in the, in the broadest sense, basically any cognitive function, it doesn't get better if you don't have sleep. Everything basically goes downhill. Your performance on essentially any cognitive task will get worse if you haven't had the right amount of sleep. Some cognitive domains are worse than others. You're particularly bad at sustaining attention, for example. And then we've also got other types of processes, particularly memory and learning, that seem to actively require sleep. So some of the activity that we know goes on during sleep seems to be particularly related to learning and memory. 
there's something about the processes, there's something about the, the brain activity, the neurophysiological processes that actually is required for you to lay down new memories. One thing that particularly gets worse is your risk taking, your decision making, your decisions become bad, the risks that you take become worse, you're more willing to take risky decisions, and you're, you're less likely to make good decisions. And this has had real world impacts, so some of the major human disasters, things like the Exxon Valdez, Chernobyl, um, the Challenger Space Shuttle disaster, if you look at the official reports associated with them, one of the contributing factors was that the people who were responsible were sleep deprived and consequently when it came to making those decisions at that moment when it was really life or death, they made bad decisions and they made risky decisions and that was contributing to the outcome of those particular disasters. It has an issue in your lives as well because if you look more mundanely at the risk of traffic accidents, the same sort of processes occur. When people are sleep deprived, they drive very badly and the risk of accidents varies throughout the day. In the early hours of the morning, it's something like seven or eight times worse than it is in the, in the middle of the day when you're most rested. So these kind of things are actually impacting on your normal daily processing. And whereas you might not think about, or you might think it's a good idea not to drink drive, you probably wouldn't even consider whether it's a good idea not to drive when you're sleep deprived. But the same kinds of bad behaviors are there. The same kind of inability to cope with the difficult and complicated task of driving is there. You may have noticed when you're tired, when you've gone without sleep, that your emotions are all up and down and generally you tend to focus more on the negative. So if you get people who are sleep deprived and you specifically test them on their emotional reactivity, it tends to be very volatile, but they tend to focus very much on the negative aspects. If you give them negative stimuli, they rate them very highly. If you give them positive stimuli, they rate them very much lower than they would when they're, um, when they're properly rested. So you get a general negative outlook on life. And normal emotion processing actually seems to require sleep in order to be um, performed properly. And this has been suggested as, if we can get the next one, this has been suggested as one of the underlying causes for the, what's quite a clear link between sleep and mental health, particularly depression and anxiety. So you can imagine that this, this overall negative view is a sort of precursor to the type of really clinical problems that people have within clinical depression. And there's quite a strong literature that suggests that periods of insomnia are predictive of the development of depression, and people who suffer from insomnia are at higher risk of developing depression than those who are well rested. You get into some problems when you talk about sleep in relation to all of these things as to whether it's a causal factor, whether the mental health issue is causing the sleep problems, whether the sleep problems are causing the mental health issues. And that's definitely different for different mental health problems. In anxiety, it's probably the case that the anxiety causes sleep problems. But in all mental health issues, not just in depression and anxiety, there's, there's almost all of them have a very strong sleep related aspect to them, whether that's actually in terms of there being a diagnostic factor that involves sleep, as there is in depression and anxiety, or whether it's just disrupted sleep patterns that um, accompany particular mental health problems. But it's not just mental health and it's not just normal brain function that requires you to be well rested and to, to have a good night's sleep. All aspects essentially of your physical health are tied with sleep, particularly things like weight gain and diabetes. So, Normal hormonal regulation, and it's pretty much true for all hormones, is disrupted by reduced sleep patterns. So if you consider the hormones that regulate appetite, which are leptin and ghrelin, people who are sleep deprived have abnormal concentrations of these two hormones and consequently, behaviorally, they feel very hungry. And what they do is they go out and seek calorie rich foods. They eat too much and they eat the wrong foods because they're sleep deprived. That leads to the link, or is, is suggested as the underlying mechanism for the link between poor sleep patterns, particularly short sleep durations, and the development of obesity. But also, because normal hormonal regulation requires sleep, insulin is also disrupted with short sleep durations. So you've also got a risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes, which is short sleep durations. This is also true, it's not just within these two factors. If you look at cardiovascular health, if you look at the immune system, for example, if you're sleep deprived and someone 
exposes you to the common cold, you're more likely to develop a common cold if you're sleep deprived than if you're well rested. And generally the immune system seems to benefit from having a proper level of sleep. We have another one. If health isn't your thing, if you're really not bothered about health, how about the impact on the economy? So there's a study from a few years ago that tried to estimate the effect on the economy of Quebec, province of Canada, has about 8 million people, I think, of poor sleep patterns. And they came up with a figure of 6.6 .6 billion Canadian dollars a year. Now, if you scale that up to the UK, in terms of number of people and converted it to pounds, you get to about 28 billion pounds a year lost to the economy because of people's poor sleep patterns. Now, you can argue about the figures. The majority of that, sort of 75% of it, was lost productivity because basically people who are sleep deprived don't work to the same rate. They don't do the same kind of job as they would if they were well rested. But there's other factors, so hospitalization related to um, poor sleep. Alcohol is a measure to try and self-medicate yourself because it tends to lead you to fall asleep quickly. The problem is it tends to then lead you to have a very poor sleeping pattern and you tend to get um, dependent upon alcohol. So it doesn't really help. So there's the financial implication there, which you can really argue with the numbers. They're not easy to, easy to actually estimate, but there probably is a very large financial impact on society from people being too tired to do their jobs. And if all of that doesn't convince you, there's a study from a few years ago that basically took photos of people when they were well rested and after they were sleep deprived, showed them to another group of people, and essentially the take home factor is that you are ugly if you haven't slept well. So if you want to look nice, sleep well, otherwise people perceive you as uglier than you need to be. We come to a big picture of the brain. You might have noticed that there's a, been a bit of an emphasis on the brain in what I've been talking about. That's because the brain's obviously the best organ. Other organs are all right, you know, but the brain is the organ that is really affected by sleep. The brain is the organ that really defines sleep. And all of those sleep stages we've talked about, they're really primarily defined by what happens during, in the brain and the type of activity the brain throws out in those different sleep stages. We don't really understand what sleep is there for at all. Um, there's those links, we know what sleep is linked with, but the fundamental purpose of sleep, or the fundamental purpose is, it's not really well understood. Most people would agree that it's probably to do with brain function, so if you want to have a healthy functioning brain, if you look through the animal kingdom, sleep is there, it's evolutionarily preserved, it's obviously very important, but we're in a time when the demands on people during the day and the amount of things that they can do in the daytime hours and the, the extent to which they can stretch the daytime hours out as long as they want to to the detriment of sleep means that we're in a time when people are sleeping less and we're sleeping less essentially than our bodies are set up to do and that our brains are set up to do. So if I can convince you of anything, maybe tonight when you're thinking, well, shall I stay up extra, that extra hour and, and do something else? Should I go to bed because I'm tired? Should I stay asleep that little bit longer? Hopefully I've convinced you that that little bit of extra sleep, you won't have this cumulative effect that builds up over time and all of these factors that we've talked about will actually be diminished and you'll end up being a, a lot healthier as well as be more beautiful than you are, but you're obviously very beautiful. I didn't mean to send you really beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs>